Hello, I'm Goat King. Welcome to the ROM. This is the fourth video in my series where we go over the design and creation of a Zelda-themed dungeon in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Today we go over a couple of combat challenge rooms as well as a couple of puzzle rooms that allow us that allow the players to use the main gimmick of the dungeon. I'll put our drawing that we made of the dungeon layout up now that we origi originally designed. Let's get into the zombie room. Um, this is going to be a challenge room to get them a, another coin so that they can get through one of the doors. Uh, in this we're going to use two zombie hulks, each with the unkillable ability added to them. This is going to make them each a CR7 monster. CR7 monster is two less than the party level nine. So each of them is worth 20 XP, uh, making the encounter of 40 XP. So trivial encounter. I'm gonna throw in the stat block and an image for the unkillable ability here. The zombie hulks have dark vision, of course, perception plus eight. Their only skill is athletics, which is a plus 18. Their strength is their highest score, closely followed by constitution. They are slowed as all zombies are, so they only get two actions per round instead of three. Armor class 21, fortitude being their highest save and reflex being their lowest with an HP of 160. As most zombies, they are bullet sponges. They can take a lot of beating. They're immune to death effects, disease, mental, paralyzed, poison, and unconscious. They have a weakness to positive 10. They would have had a weakness to slashing 10. However, the unkillable ability, uh, lose the weakness to slashing and gain resistance against all damage at its level, minimum 3. Of course, the level for this creature is 7, so it gains resistance 7 to all damage. And it gains a weakness equal to twice its level to critical hits. So on a critical hit, instead of being resistant to the damage, it's going to have weakness 14 to the damage. The resistance 7 to all damage would include the positive damage. Uh, but here, I'm gonna, weakness 10, resistance 7, in this case, I'm gonna say it has weakness 3 to positive damage. I'm just gonna cancel those out. Speed of 25 feet, uh, with a melee hunk of meat, plus 17 with a reach of 15 feet. This is a huge monster. Uh, 2d10 plus 9 bludgeoning damage. And then ranged. Hunk of meat plus 9. Thrown 10 feet. Damage 2d10 plus 9 bludgeoning damage. There's also a ranged corpse plus 17. Brutal range, range increment of 30 feet. Damage 2d6 plus 9 bludgeoning. Uh, they've got the ability corpse throwing. A zombie hulk can throw corpses at foes. While any medium dead body will do... They sometimes throw zombie shamblers, who take just as much damage from being thrown as the target they hit. A thrown shambler lands prone, but if it's not destroyed, it can rise and use other actions normally. There won't be any shamblers in this encounter, but if a party member goes down, believe that they are ammunition for the zombie hulk. And wide swing. The zombie hulk makes a hunk of meat strike and compares the attack roll result against the AC of up to two foes, each of whom, whom must be within the strike's reach. This attack counts as two attacks for the Zombie Hulk's multiple attack penalty. So Wide Swing adds another action to it. So their melee, hunk of meat, one action, plus Wide Swing, two actions. 
gets two targets, or you compare the one attack roll to the armor classes of both, and then afterwards their multiple attack penalty advances as if they had made two attacks. Of course, being a zombie, they only have two actions, so they won't be able to do anything past that. This would be the stand and fight kind of situation. Let's design the room, shall we? We're going to treat this room like it was an armory for the guards of the ancient king's treasury. So we're going to have various large racks and cabinets for weapons, as well as the zombie hulks won't be immediately visible when the characters enter the room. One back here and then maybe one over here or one over here. <clears throat> this will allow the players to get into the room and almost get comfortable before the actual fight begins. You can have this door lock when they walk in. Uh, in that case, you can make it a coin door. And then when the zombies are defeated, drop two coins. In fact, that's what we're going to do. We're going to make this a... Coin door that locks when they come in, and they're gonna need an extra one to get out. So the fight with the zombie hulks. Now there's there's cover. There's areas to move around. Some areas that will be difficult for. Mm -hmm. The zombie hulks to get through, they'd have to squeeze, but there you go. This should be a fairly simple fight. It is trivial, so while they are big, they shouldn't be too difficult to kill for the players. Go find some treasure, as well as some coins that the zombies drop. I would suggest dropping some consumables from the level 9 consumables loot on page 539 of the core rule book. Maybe drop a ninth level permanent item as well. Could be fun. This is a dungeon after all. One of the exciting parts about it is getting loot. The important part there is that you you look through that and you pick something that works for your party specifically. This is general loot you're giving out. You don't really want to give your players stuff that's not really useful for any of their characters. Now, on the other side of the Great Chamber, there was another locked door that once they get through it, they'll find the Mechanism Room. In this room, the actual mechanism for running the staircase and changing which way it points is housed. There is a, a pillar in the center of the room with, with handles that stick out and there's a grate on the floor and you can see down through it there are various gears and clockwork mechanisms. And if they try and like push on the gear, it's, it's just too difficult. They, they can't turn the pillar. Um, doesn't really matter what athletics check they do. This is heavy machinery and it's just not doable by a person. However, there is a divot in the top of the pillar. The pillar is about chest height. Uh, there is a, a sort of pyramid shaped divot in it. And there would be rooms around it that would allow say an arcana check to say, hey, there is a magical motor of some kind that when placed in this hole will power the pillar and allow it to be turned more easily. From there, there is a door leading north, unlocked, uh, and if they go into it, this will be the spider room, which will be good fun. 
I'm going to show you the stat block for the giant tarantula now. The giant tarantula can be found on page 307 of the first bestiary book. And we're going to have that be the enemy in here. It's going to be large, so 2 by 2 squares. Uh, acrobatics plus 9, Athletics plus 12, Stealth plus 11, HP 135. Uh, it's a CR6 creature, so this is definitely um, trivial. You might even put two of them in here. Uh, it's got a Melee Fangs plus 17, Damage 2d8 plus 8, uh, plus Giant Tarantula Venom. Uh, melee Leg, plus 17, Reach of 10 feet, uh, Damage 1d8, plus 8, Bludgeoning, plus Knockdown. Uh, hairy Barrage, a tarantula flicks its leg legs, flinging spidery hairs in a 15-foot cone. This deals 46 piercing damage with a DC 25 basic reflex save. And Giant Tarantula Venom, Poison. Saving throw DC 23, maximum duration 8 rounds, stage 1, 1d6 poison 1 round, stage 2, 1d6 poison flat footed and clumsy, stage 3, and so on. At stage 4, you are paralyzed. We're gonna, when they enter this room, um, they're gonna notice a couple of things pretty quickly. One, there are spider webs around, um, and two, there is a pile with bones and armor that they've seen on the various other monsters in the dungeon, the various zombies and skeletons having armor from the ancient king's kingdom. Let's go ahead and design the room before we get more into this encounter. Okay, that's the design of the room, and these two X's are because we're also going to add a couple of traps to the room, something to make the combat more interesting overall. These are Web Lurker Nooses, they're on page 325 of the Bestiary, I'm going to throw their stat block up now. They have a stealth DC of 22, um, to disable them it's their survival or survival trained or thievery expert. DC 18 to rearrange the webbing. We're going to up the DC to 26 to match with the other traps that we have in our dungeon. Armor class 18, fortitude 11, reflex 5. The web noose has a rea an attack reaction. Uh, if a creature steps into the square with the web tripwire, the web lurker noose makes a noose strike against the triggered creature. Uh, this is a melee attack with a plus 13 and deadly d10. Damage 3d6 bludgeoning. The target is grabbed and pulled, uh, uh, pulled off the ground. With an escape DC of 22, the target takes 1d6 bludgeoning damage at the end of each of its turns as long as it's caught in the noose. The noose attack happens... When it's initially triggered, it's plus 13, 3d6 bludgeoning, deadly d10. So it'll do 3d6 bludgeoning, or if it crits, it'll do 3d6 uh, doubled, plus 1d10. Also, <laughs> grabbed and pulled up off the ground. Uh, escape DC 22. Pretty cool stuff. Um, this might get a couple of the players. Some of them might notice it. This will be something where you'll roll their perception in secret uh, to see if they actually notice these while also dealing with the two spiders that will inevitably come down from the ceiling if one of these is triggered or pampered with or if the players look up and see the spiders. When this all triggers... Webs will block this doorway. This doorway is already blocked with webs, but webs will block this doorway. 
so the players can't just leave. Um, they do battle, fight off the spiders. This should be another trivial encounter. Um, the traps might make things a little more interesting, but this should still be a trivial encounter. Fight them off, and then they can remove the webs from both the entranceway they came in and the door to get out. The final room in the series of rooms will be a puzzle room, fairly simple layout. There'll be a altar of sorts in the middle with a square double pyramid. Not entirely sure proper way to describe that, but this shape, essentially, a D8 sitting atop it in a divot that allows it to rest point up. It'll have carvings around it as well as metalwork and glass that's dim and dark in little strips. Uh, and the altar itself will have writings on it that can be figured out using an arcana roll. And Essentially what it's asking for is seven levels of spells. So you could cast seven, you could spend seven level one spell slots or one seventh level spell slot. The player shouldn't have seventh level spells yet. So they'll have to spend multiple lower spell slots in order to make this work. But once they do, the energy will move from the altar up into the D8 artifact. We're going to call it the motor stone. Um, and it'll, it'll glow from beneath the glass and metal. They'll be able to take this, bring it back to the mechanism room, place it in the pillar, and then they'll be able to turn the pillar and thus turn the staircase as well. Well, that was our dungeon. We managed to go through our zombie combat room. We detailed the mechanism room. We went through our spider combat, as well as going through the spell puzzle room uh, that requires the use of spell slots in order to power the motor stone. With all of this that they've gathered, uh, they've got another gold coin. They have the ability to turn the staircase, they should be able to progress further in the main dungeon past the central room, which they haven't been able to do up till now. In the next video, we will go over the mini boss as well as obtaining the key for the boss door. Thank you for watching. See you next week.